In Viking culture, marriage was the heart of family structure. It offered stability and served as a way to control sexual activity and reproduction in the community. Since the Vikings didn't really record their own history beyond their poetic sagas, much about their wedding practices is still mysterious. But we do know a few things. So... Today, we're going to take a look at some highly symbolic and kind of outlandish Viking wedding traditions and rituals. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other topics you would like to hear about. Okay, break out your fancy horned helmet, because we're going to a Viking wedding. In modern times, people tend to marry for love, but for Vikings, it was a little different. Marriage wasn't just a union of the couple, but of entire families. It was a transaction that was known as brutkau, which means bride buying, and it involved lawyers. There's nothing more romantic than the amorous smell of a lawyer. These types of unions had long-lasting legal implications in Norse culture, affecting everything from property holdings to inheritance. Nothing could be left to chance, so intricate negotiations were carried out before the terms of a marriage were formally agreed upon. In a nutshell, once a man selected a bride-to-be, usually on the advice of his parents, he, along with his father, nearest relatives, and best friends, would go ask the maiden's parents for their consent. This deal would then be sealed by a handshake between the girl's guardian and the suitor or his representative. At that point, the groom's family, along with their legal delegates, who basically filled the role of modern lawyers, negotiated with the bride's family to fix the amount of the bride price and the dowry. The groom's family, legal counsel, and any important local figures to whom they had connections could then bring proposals to the bride's family, promising to support and assist them while agreeing upon mutually beneficial terms for the marriage. It wasn't until after the money stuff was done that the happy couple could set a date. Picking a date for a wedding is always a tricky thing, and it was no different in Viking times. In fact, setting the date for a Viking wedding was a whole process. Traditionally, weddings were held on Friday, which in Norse religion is a sacred day for Frigg, the goddess of marriage. Friday, which means day of Frigg, is actually named after this very goddess. Weddings typically lasted a week, and family and friends usually had to travel all the way from the land of ice and snow, from the midnight sun where the hot springs flow, to the site of the wedding. This meant that winter weddings were pretty much impossible because snow made travel extremely difficult. It also meant that the wedding party had to provide appropriate accommodations and enough food and drink for all the guests for the duration of the ceremony. Other considerations included the brewing of a special ale to be drunk by the bride and groom as part of the ceremony. It was a lot to think about and pulling it all off sometimes meant a very long timetable for a wedding. While most ceremonies took place within a year from when all the negotiations were settled, three-year waiting periods were not uncommon for Vikings in Iceland, whose frequent trips to Norway made it difficult to pin down an ideal date for everyone involved. In the lead-up to the wedding, Norse brides and grooms were separated so they could symbolically strip away their former selves before entering their new lives together. What does that mean? Well, for the bride, it meant getting rid of old clothing and any symbols of her unwed status, such as her kransen, which is a gilt circlet worn by Scandinavian girls. The kransen, symbolic of the virginity the bride would also presumably be shedding, was then stored for the bride's future daughter. Two points for recycling. Then, during the wedding ceremony, the kransen was replaced with a bridal crown. During her sequestration, the bride would cleanse herself in a bathhouse. But this wasn't just a relaxing day in the tub. There was a standard bathing practice. Hot stones were placed in the bath to produce steam, and then women often then switched themselves with birch twigs to induce perspiration, which symbolically washed away a bride's maiden status. So watch out for those birch twigs, ladies. Once the bath was finished, the bride plunged into cold water to close the pores and end the cleansing process. Throughout these preparations, women were attended by their mother, married sisters, and other married female relatives and friends. So much for privacy. Like Viking brides, grooms also may have undergone symbolic rituals before entering their new lives as married men. 
His attendants would be his father, married brothers, and other married males. And in order to rid themselves of bachelorhood and destroy all vestiges of the unmarried self, Viking men participated in a symbolic sword ceremony. You knew swords or axes were going to be involved one way or another. The ceremony started with a little casual grave robbing. According to many of the Norse sagas, and some historians believe archaeological data verifies it, a groom-to-be would break into a grave in order to retrieve the family sword of an ancestor. Through this action, he entered death as a boy and emerged into life as a man reborn. Once the groom had his sword, he, like his bride, went to a bathhouse to symbolically wash away his bachelor status and purify himself for the wedding ceremony. During his cleansing, he'd gain insight and instruction on husbandly and fatherly duties from his attendants. Archaeologists have been so far unable to determine if rubber duckies were involved. The final act of pre-wedding preparation for a Viking bride was dressing for the ceremony. Unlike modern brides, Viking ladies didn't wear elaborate costumes or gowns. Rather, the ornamental focus was on her hair and crown. A woman's hair was very important in Viking culture and indicative of her sexual allure. The longer, the better. So you probably didn't see a lot of pixie cuts. As a replacement for the consin, brides wore a bridal crown, which was typically a family heirloom. These crowns were usually made of silver adorned with crystals and elaborate designs like crosses and clover leaves, and draped with red and green garland silk cords. As for the groom, after completing the bathing ritual, he dressed for the wedding. Like the bride, a Viking groom had no particular costume or ornate garment he was required to wear. He did, however, bring his newly acquired sword to the ceremony, and may have also carried a symbol of Thor, such as a hammer, an axe, or, unless Marvel's Endgame has led us astray, a PlayStation 4. Showing up with such a weapon was symbolic of the groom's mastery in the union, and was believed to ensure a fruitful marriage. Once the premarital rituals were finished, the ceremony began. First came the exchange of the dowry and the bride price, before witnesses. Once everyone had their respective financial gifts, they would begin the religious part of the ceremony. This meant summoning the attention of the gods and goddesses, a process that may have involved a sacrifice and incantation. If a sacrifice was necessary, Vikings used animals associated with gods of fertility. For Thor, a goat. For Freja, a sow. For Frey, a boar or horse. The animal's blood was collected in a bowl and placed on an altar. A bundle of fir twigs was then dipped in the blood and used to sprinkle the couple, conferring the blessings of the gods and presumably creating a lot of work for the couple's dry cleaner. In some cases, sacred animals were dedicated as living gifts. We imagine the animals were way more into that version rather than the whole blood sacrifice thing. In modern wedding ceremonies, the bride and groom exchange rings as a symbol of their vows. And while Vikings did exchange rings, they also exchanged something far more badass. Yeah, you guessed it. Swords. During a Viking wedding, the groom would present an ancestral sword to his bride, which she would then keep for any future sons they may have. The bride, in turn, then gifted the groom with a sword of her ancestors, symbolizing a transfer of the father's protection of the bride to the husband. This gift exchange also symbolized sacred union, sanctified by mystic rites. Once the awesome part with the swords was over, the bride and groom then exchanged rings to further consecrate their wedding vows. But they even did this part cooler than we do. How? By offering rings to one another on the hilt of their new swords. Attempts to reconstruct the details of the Viking wedding ceremony have proven difficult for researchers. The information given in the sagas places a heavy emphasis on the legal bindings, rituals, and practicalities, but the details of the wedding feast itself were not as thoroughly documented. Nobody is exactly sure why this is, but it may be due to Christianity replacing pagan practices around the time Viking sagas were first written. What we do know is that the bridal and groom parties moved from the ceremony to the feast in a ritual called Brudhlup, which means bride running, or alternately, Brudhgumareif, which means the bridegroom's ride. It sounds pretty mysterious, but in Christian days, this simply consisted of the two parties walking, separately, from the site of the ceremony to the site of the feast. 
In pagan days, parties raced to the feast, and whichever party lost the race served beer to the winners for the night. In Christian Scandinavia, the groom arrived at the location of the feast and blocked the door to prevent the bride from entering without his assistance. Once she arrived, the groom helped her cross the threshold without tripping, hopefully. In this way, the bride completed her symbolic journey from maidenhood to marriage with the assistance of her husband. Once in the feast hall, the groom buried his sword in the ceiling, which we assume was a maze balls to watch, and the depth to which the sword sunk was believed to symbolize the enduring nature of the union. Earning the blessings of the gods was an important step on the path to becoming a parent and continuing the Viking bloodline. For example, at the feast, a representation of Thor's hammer, Mjolnir, was placed in the bride's lap as she asked for Thor's blessing. If you're thinking that the symbolism of placing a hammer between the bride's leg is a little risque, well, you nailed it. The hammer was considered a symbol of Thor's manhood, and laying it on a new bride's womb and genitals was highly symbolic of exactly what you probably thought it was. Elsewhere in the Norse canon, the goddess Vor was said to witness a couple's vows and perhaps watch over the feast. Frey and Frigg were also often called upon in matters of love and marriage. It was a legal requirement for the bride and groom to drink bride ale together at their post-wedding feast. We assume some Viking microbrewery lobbied for that law. But it was very important for the couple, as their union was only binding once they drank together. The ale, for the record, was usually a honey-based mead, and the wedding could only go forward if the couple had enough of it to last a month, because it had to be drunk throughout their honeymoon. The first serving was presented to the groom by his wife in a vessel like the Swedish kosa, known as a loving cup. The bride might recite a formal verse while presenting the ale. Before drinking it, the groom consecrated the ale to Thor by making the sign of a hammer over it and making a toast to Odin. He then sipped and passed the cup to his bride, who made a toast to Freya before drinking. The final wedding night ritual entailed escorting the newlyweds to the bridal couch. At least six witnesses led the couple by torchlight to their bed, where they consummated their marriage in full view of the witnesses. This ritual existed so there would be no doubt as to the consecration and validity of the marriage, and enough witnesses to settle any legal disputes that might arise. This is one Viking tradition we're pretty sure all modern married couples are happy to see consigned to the days of yore. So what do you think? Would you do a Viking-style wedding? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.